brief background i'm i'm an mba from iim ahmedabad and graduate from iit i've been a global financial service executive and a board of director with 30 plus years of experience successfully building and scaling organizations uh, held senior roles in city and tata consultancy services across the globe uh, my bio as well as uh, bios of all speakers will be projected on the screen in the interest of time only brief introductions would be made here we request you to refer to our event page on wheels website for more details on our distinguished speakers wheels embarked in 2006 as a pan iit initiative and formally incorporated as a non profit entity both in usa and india its mission is to improve the lives in rural india by technology enabled solutions to bring transformation we tap iits and other similar institutions for co creating innovative solutions we work collaboratively with proven on the ground ngos and other partners such as those speaking today our projects cover six areas as the name suggests water health education energy livelihood and sustainability a brief introduction to wheels 30 plus initiatives was presented prior to the start of this event and will also run at the conclusion as you know wheels is a volunteer organization and depend on the generosity of our donors who share a vision of impacting 20% of india's rural and underserved population by 2030 you can also get additional information at our website www.wheelsglobal.org a quick disclaimer all views expressed by the speaker in this webinar are their own and do not reflect nor endorsed by wheels global foundation or its board now some housekeeping messages all attendant attendees are on mute through the webinar you may ask questions to the speakers by entering in the qa box You can also chat with one of us by raising your hand or typing your request in the chat box. A recording of this event will also be available on our website and on YouTube. Questions from the audience will be curated and channeled to the speaker by our session moderator. Now it is my distinct honor to introduce our moderator, Ambassador Pradeep Kapoor. Ambassador Kapoor is a co-chair of Wheels Livelihoods Council as well as co-chair of Board of Advisors and acknowledged luminary diplomat with a distinguished career working closely on important geopolitical issues with prime ministers and presidents of various countries and leaders and policy makers on different continents including Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee and president pranam mukherjee in india an engineering and management graduate of indian institute of technology delhi with distinction mr kapoor was selected for the prestigious indian foreign service and was secretary government of india working as a transformational ambassador of india to cambodia and chile over to you ambassador kapoor thank you very much rajiv for the introduction to the program also today to the webinar uh welcome everybody to today's webinar by wheels livelihood council my video on and check out 64% of india's population that is about 900 million people live in villages in india this is more than the combined population of the western world or more than the population of the two biggest continents of the world north america and south america combined skilling for relevant local employment and entrepreneurial opportunities of 300 million plus working age youth is one of the biggest challenges and is also one of the highest priorities for the government for the social impact organizations and for private enterprises in order to support india's march to become a developed economy the government of india has been investing heavily through a multitude 
of large scale infrastructure initiatives, including in rural livelihood missions at the center and at the states, the National Skill Development Corporation of, you will be hearing about that from the former MD of NSDC, the ONDC, et cetera. However, the gargantuan scale of the challenge is too big to achieve without the leverage of technology, innovative models, and effective public-private partnerships. Livelihood being one of WHEEL's six priorities, we have built a partner ecosystem and portfolio of nearly a dozen very innovative, sustainable livelihood solutions across the country to tackle this together. In this webinar, our third in the series, after recent ones on education and health, we are pleased, extremely pleased to feature six pioneers and accomplished thought leaders to discuss their original you know, thinking, creative and scalable business models, unique public-private partnership for large-scale interventions, the role of the government policy and infrastructure, and of course, all that underpinned by technology and community engagement for long-haul capacity and co-creation. I request our distinguished panel of speakers to also focus on how you made it sustainable and what are the key learnings and takeaways. We look forward to the participation of all mission-aligned alumni, professionals, our partners, public-private entities, and of course, donors for an engaging session and interactions. With that, it is now my pleasure to introduce our first guest speaker, Dr. Manish Kumar. Dr. Manish Kumar IAS is an economist. He has worked with national, state, and international agencies, such as the World Bank and UNICEF. In his, recent, in his very recent assignment, he had also led the National Skill Development Corporation as its managing director and CEO, driving labor force productivity and large-scale employability initiatives for the government of India. Currently, he is an international consultant for the World Bank and Gojo and & Company Japan, he is a visiting professor of infrastructure economics in Indian School of Business and distinguished professor of economics in Manav Rajna University, India. Manish holds a degree in Bachelor of Technology from IIT, ISM, Dhanbad, Master in Public Administration as a Mason Fellow from Harvard University, and PhD in Public Policy from the George Washington University, where I'm currently affiliated. Dr. Manish Kumar, Please share your insights from driving large-scale skills development and rural entrepreneurship agenda at the NSDC, as well as from your stints in Tripura and the World Bank. Uh, Dr. Manish, you have seven to eight minutes. Over to you. Uh, many thanks, and uh, uh, thank you for your generous introduction. Uh, I would share uh, in uh, the given limited time a bit about India's challenge and how government of India has been trying to address that when it comes to skill development and uh, getting livelihood for citizens. So if you look at India, um, we have a population of 1 billion, which is 15 years and above. Of that, about 450 million actually are in the workforce. About 15 to 20% of them are women. And uh, we are aware that a lot of women actually are not in labor force. That's the reason why we have uh, 1 billion almost who are, who are who could potentially be there, but a large number who is not there, actually. Among those who are uh, rural, almost 300 million. Um, when we look at the labor force, 150 uh, are actually in the urban area. However, in the rural part, uh, the number of agricultural jobs is actually just half of what uh, the labor force is. And the real work actually is in the urban area. So that's, I think, the kind of um, you know, uh, metrics within which I think the situation is operating. Every year, about 10 million people enter into workforce. So people who are 
14 years, they become 15 years and therefore become eligible for looking for work and therefore they're considered part of the labor force. So there are 10 million of them who are joining labor force. <clears throat> now, given this magnitude of problem and getting a sense of that, uh, from the national level uh, and the state level, as well as from the private sector's perspective, these are th three views which I will share and also a bit about how the World Bank, uh, ADB, uh, World Economic Forum, et cetera, think about this problem of skills and wh what could be done to address that. So in the first one, at the national level, you would notice a lot of action that has been taken by government of India. They have recognized that skill is a case of market failure. So it's not basically the, the private sector which will drive uh, through its financing, but that you, you actually need to put in public money into it. So a large amount of public money has begun to come into skilling uh, arena. And uh, we, we also find that some of the new institutions that have come up, for example, Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship is a new ministry set up only in 2015 um, and uh, increasingly getting more important. It wasn't there earlier. So basically recognizing the fact that India needs uh, a specific attention uh, to this particular aspect. Then we have sector skill councils, which are industry bodies. There are about 37 of them uh, covering a range of things. Uh, from, so let's say, we can talk about capital goods as a sector skill council, to gems and jewelries have a sector skill council, to beauty and wellness as a sector skill council. And there are 37 different types of sector skill council covering uh, all the three sectors of the econ economy, primary, secondary, and tertiary. All the three are covered. So that's the interesting part of it. Uh, <clears throat> then it's also set up uh, through the Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship, bodies like National Skill Development Corporation, which is a public-private partnership, 51% uh, actually held by uh, the private sector, 49 by government, but essentially implementing government's agenda. So that's his primary role. Uh, the interesting thing is that it does short-term scaling. It doesn't do long-term scaling. Uh, so, and the long-term scaling is done by ITIs, uh, which were always there in India for quite long, but now works under Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship and is increasingly getting modernized because of this understanding uh, of the need for changes out there. So we find new policies uh, on skill development, which was not earlier there. Now you have a formal policy. Uh, we have also National, National Council, for, Council for Vocational Education and Training, which is a certification body and an assessment uh, accreditation body, which was very important for ensuring that uh, any course that you take, which is blue collar, whether it is in Nagaland or whether it is in uh, Kerala, is certified for quality on the on in, in certain basis, on the basis of some standards. So that's also there. And uh, so therefore, they, this is like the broad framework within which it operates. Now, there are challenges too, because when you're trying to skill such a large number of people, uh, and that too in a short time, uh, there are different types of difficulties that arise. The first one is identifying how do you get the right partner uh, who could do that. And usually, Government has its own institution through which it drives things, but it also looks towards private sector because the number of people that have to be reached out is immense. And, and therefore, uh, private sector partnership becomes quite critical. So I, and I'm aware that Kalyan is here and he'll talk quite a bit about how government partners uh, with uh, private sector to ensure that quality comes out. And he's one of the best that I've seen. So he'll, he will hear quite a bit uh, on how things are uh, when things really work well. But there are, there are situations when it doesn't work well. Uh, the reason being that when you have such a massive program going on, which is for about three months, and uh, there was a time when the, when the skilling suddenly scaled up and began to touch almost 10, one, 10 billion people, uh, one crore, every year. And once you have that scale of operation, which is all through a backbone of, uh, uh, of electronic systems, it becomes exceedingly difficult uh, to understand what's the quality. And therefore, there would be uh, all kinds of monitoring checks, etc. What I've noticed is in the state government level, there would be fear about skills. And this is an important thing to understand. Unlike putting money into roads, where you can see the infrastructure actually coming up, because you can see a black tar, which is on top of uh, some, some road which is coming up, and you know that construction has occurred. In the case of skills, there was always this fear that will the money be misused? And uh, will the private sector, you know, misuse the money? And how do you even make out if there is going to be a change in the brain of someone and they, they get better pay? So we began to do some research, actually, to try to understand that are there changes coming in because of people getting skilled? And we found some very interesting uh, findings. 
One was that people who got trained through PMKVY would normally get wages compared to a cohort of similar type uh, control group about 10% 10, 10 more than uh, a person who, who has not been skilled. So in, an immediate gain that you could see there. And also that every one rupee that government of India was putting in on skills was leading to a so net social return of four rupees in the long term. So therefore, a lot of positive gains out of that. Uh, we, we, however, were also facing criticism about the fact that a lot of people join and leave the job. And we did some research to understand why do they leave the job. Uh, we found that youths normally when they join after getting skilled for about three to six months, get about eight or 9,000 rupee per month as they, uh, as they pay. Their expectation from life was about 18,000. So basically, if they got 500 rupee extra, they would immediately change jobs. And therefore, there was complaint constantly that, you know, there's too much of attrition, which is still there, by the way. And the attrition surprisingly stops as soon as they began to get, get paid about 18,000. Then it stops. So we were asking the industry, why don't you pay 18,000 if that's the case? And they said that if we paid 18,000, uh, one is that we will not be competitive. Second, we want them to stay for at least two years or at least one and a half year, and we'll be willing to pay 18,000, but they need to stay. So therefore, there was a kind of um, the, a dilemma between who, who actually you know, takes that lead first, uh, whether people will stay back long enough to get that 18,000 or they will just uh, respond to a 500 extra and keep moving on. So these were quite important, you know, uh, understanding of the dynamics among students and what really is happening in the job market. Uh, and a few other challenges, particularly among the private partners, which I noticed, is the risk perception, because the risk actually determines uh, the risk perception that how much, uh, uh, how, how stable is the business? Uh, particularly when we look at it from an economist perspective, a 10% return in real terms would normally be quite okay, 5 to 10%, some, somewhere in between that. 10 is actually on the higher side. Uh, a real rate of return would actually be quite okay uh, in, in this particular sector. But my first uh, survey on this particular aspect showed the expectation of almost 25%. It reduced later when we stabilized the policy um, environment to about 16%. It had come down. So, so the effectively, the private sector was saying that we are scared because we are making a lot of investments, and these investments is leading to uh, fear among us that if the program does not st remain stable uh, from the government side because a lot of money is coming from there, we might actually face difficulties, and therefore we try to make returns as fast as possible. And that was not a very healthy thing. We we we, we realized that this is not a stable kind of environment, and. Uh, <laughs> Lot of talks yeah. about Dr. Manish Kumar, we'll have to. I know it's very, very interesting and so fascinating. We'll also request you to share your paper with us, but uh, in case we have anything written down, but if we if we can just conclude, yeah, sure. So, there's just one last thing which I had to speak about was the work which World Economic Forum, the World Bank, and few others have been uh, talking about and wanting government of India to include, which government of India has done too, is essentially the uh, issue of soft skills, the non-cognitive part, the fact that a lot of uh, what you earn in life is actually not dependent on just your technical skills. It's also your ability to communicate, work in teams, etc. And uh, it's, it's a good thing that uh, these things are being emphasized now. I, I know Kalyan will speak about this because he does it excellently. And you'll hear <laughs> more. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Manish Kumar. We look forward to Continuing the conversation and having uh, longer sessions with you because uh, you have so much of uh, background experience and uh, understanding of this area. And we need a lot of that in wheels also to expand and scale up our operations. But uh, it has been very, very interesting. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. And please stay on for the rest of the session to answer questions later. And now it is my distinct honor to introduce our dear friend, Dr. Sarika Kulkarni. Uh, she is the founder and chief executive of Ra Foundation, Ra, R-A-A-H, The Path, a non-profit organization that works at the nexus of planet and people. The foundation works with some of the most vulnerable communities living in one of the biodiverse hotspots of the world, the northern western ghats in India. Her work on planet is creating water-secure villages and converting barren land into carbon sinks through an integrated approach. A work with people is aimed at making them resilient through sustainable climate start 
livelihood. Sarika ji, along with the amazing work in rehabilitation of very sensitive and ecologically strategic Sayadri mountains, Ra Foundation seems to have figured out a highly scalable and efficient vocational training program for underprivileged youth with assured jobs. I request you to please share with us how this program has come about and its unique elements and the scaling path. You have seven to eight minutes, Sarika. Sure, sure. <clears throat> Thank you so much at the outset for inviting me uh, to share our experiences. Uh, instead of starting with our success story, I would like to uh, take the liberty to begin with a story of our failures and the initial challenges that we really faced. Uh, after we founded Ra Foundation in 2011 and self-incubating for two years, we found our calling in the tribal indigenous belt of Maharashtra, as uh, Ambassador Kapoor mentioned, Northern Western Guards. Before starting any work, we wanted to understand the people and their problems and build trust in the community. The best and easiest way we thought at that point of time was through a tailoring program for women in one of the villages. We were thinking we would use this time to have deep conversations with women and understand them better. The class began with a lot of fanfare and excitement in November 2013 with 20 women. By December, five had dropped out. By February, 10 were left. And by March, the class had to be shut down as everyone left. We were giving them a stipend, which meant the women had incentive to attend, yet they were stopped coming. What was the problem? Why did the program uh, fall flat on its face? Was the trainer bad? Was the training bad? What exactly was happening here? We were like completely at you know our wits end to understand. This area, part of Northern Western Ghats, uh, is blessed and receives over 3,000 millimeters of annual rainfall, yet starts becoming water scarce immediately as soon as the monsoon gets over. Women who needed 30 minutes for fetching water in October spent two hours in December and over five hours by March. Clearly, water is the elixir of life and was a priority over everything else. After spending the day walking with heavy pots on their heads, these women were left with no time or energy or interest for any type of livelihood program, however big the incentive was. We had to go back to the drawing board, taking with us a big lesson. Livelihoods always come with in, comes with impediments. And there is a reason why there was a problem with livelihoods in the first place. And this lesson really has shaped up all the livelihood programs that we have designed in Ra Foundation. Social problems are all intertwined and we cannot take an islandic approach to solve them. We have to delayer the problems and start with the root cause that often in most cases, especially in rural areas, is the damage caused to the natural resources and degradation of the planet. Unfortunately, for years, people have attempted to thrive at the cost of planet, cutting trees, building infrastructures, uh, and took a very one-dimensional approach to progress. Our work is essentially aimed at changing this equation. We believe there can be harmony between planet and people, biodiversity and livelihoods can coexist and thrive together. Uh, you know, we our programs are very impact-driven, very, very outcome-focused. We start with what is the impact we want to see. We ask farmers, for example, in our livelihood program with small and marginal farmer, how much is a good annual income that will make his or her family happy? We then work backwards. For this income, how much land is needed? What crop types are required? What types of land parcel the farmer has? How much is the water availability? What is the soil type? And then design the solution in consultation with the farmer. Build their capacity, handhold for two years before linking, linking them with our farmer interest group that does direct selling and exit. We have uh, almost 2,500 farmer beneficiary alumni in the program and a new cohort of 500 to 600 farmers are added every year. Similarly, we spoke to women to understand the problems and impact they wish want from the program. Based on the feedback, we have created two tracks for women, micro-entrepreneurship for individual women and group business opportunity. As women thrive, many women thrive better in company of other women. Over 1,500 women are earning a decent income from the comfort of their homes and leading a life of dignity. Youth, as Dr. Manish also mentioned, is a very, very critical stakeholder, and we needed to engage them more effectively. While we are engaging rural youth in agri-related activities, we decided to look at locations where bulk of the youth are, and these were some semi-urban areas. India, as Dr. Man Manish also mentioned, is one of the youngest countries in the world with an average age of 28.4 years. 600 million people in the uh, age group of 15 to 29 13% youth are unemployed, with about 52% graduates are unemployable. And this number is even higher in case of dropout youths. 
we first as uh, as our practices be decided to begin with impediments that what are the impediments to these livelihoods and the answers were access to quality education guidance or absence of role models availability of skilled courses poverty that forced them to take whatever came their way etc our solutions clearly had to be sustainable meaning that would have to have the potential to change the youth's life for good replicable which meant that the solution was tried and tested and could be easily copied pasted to new location for a different cohort scalable should benefit a very large number of youth and market driven something that the market needed which had the potential to fill the gap we also needed one more dimension of the program speed the problem was so huge that it would and it would only get bigger by the year whatever we had to be done had to be done at a speed we piloted a 35 day course that covers all the skills that the service sector needs communication and conversation team work english speaking customer service accounting and tally computing and ms office and importantly work ethics and culture it has it is a very intense program that prepares our youth for a hard corporate life our placement cell provides local opportunities in retail back office bpos or banks with an average starting salary of 200000 per annum which is definitely much more than what dr manish mentioned in the in his uh, talk we also provide a six months hand holding uh, support to these youth to address any teething troubles they may face in their early days in a company our alumni network provides peer learning and peer support their life changes within a month slowly we have seen the families to transition as the security of one person's good job can do wonders these youth become role models for other youth in their families and communities and the cascading and triggering effect is immense each year over 3000 youth undergo this transformational journey through our 16 odd centers across maharashtra and one in gujarat and we feel we have barely scratched the surface and just begun before concluding i want to leave all of you with five lessons that we have learned while implementing livelihood programs which are innovative and at scale most importantly there are deep rooted problems and what we see or hear is only minuscule percentage of the situation we have must dig deeper and understand the why before finding the how we need a model that is customizable and flexible sustainable replicable scalable and importantly market driven like we work with farmers to un- first we understand what the market needs and work with farmers to grow those crops we understand what the industry needs and train our youth to find jobs in those markets solutions need to be owned by people we believe in change without charity and people have to participate in kind or cash in the process the skin in the game makes the program very strong and effective most of the livelihood programs take a long time to develop adopt them and adapting best practices and tried and tested solutions can work wonders in most cases we do that all the time bottom up approach outcome focus impact driven theory of change community led development and design thinking are not just jargons but extremely critical tools that has helped us immensely thank, thank you. you so much ambassador <clears throat> thank you so much sarika what a brilliant uh, you know this this discussion and uh, explanation of all the phenomenal work that you're doing on the field uh, every time i hear you i learn something more and uh, congratulations to you and uh, may you continue doing even uh, you know at greater scale because you're already doing a lot but the scale of the challenge is absolutely staggering it's like an ocean absolutely. as you yourself have said so it is very important to continue and expand the footprint thank you thank you once thank again you. thank you so much uh now i have the distinct honor to introduce mr raghuraj rajendran uh ias secretary technical education skill development and employment in the government of madhya pradesh uh he hails from kerala and has done his btech in electronics and communication engineering from the national institute of technology in calicut as a member of the ias He has experience in administration at the district level and governance at the state and national levels. He has undertaken responsibilities in the areas of information technology, rural development and energy. He has served in various positions in the government of India and the state government of Madhya Pradesh. For example, the MD of MPP MCL 
as the Joint Secretary, Ministry of Power, as the Director, PMO. PMO stands for the Indian Prime Minister's Office, which is a very important position. He has authored two books, 3S and Our Health and Advaitonomics. Uh, Raghuraj Ji, the Madhya Pradesh government has initiated several compelling programs to upskill its communities across a very large and diverse state and create jobs. One of the wheels partners, Saukhyam, is contributing in Madhya Pradesh, in Baranpur area. Please share your experiences, insights, and recommendations for entities like Wheels and others represented here to accelerate that journey. Thank you very much. You have about eight minutes. Over to you, Raghuraj ji. Uh, thank you. I hope I am audible. Yes, am we I can hear. Yes. Go ahead, please. Your video is coming a little bit fuzzy. I'm wondering whether uh, we can change your background to normal. Uh, JBG, do you, can you shift the... Uh -huh. Yeah, maybe maybe I uh, I can just continue to speak uh, even as you try and work on it. Uh, uh, there's sure. some back, background issue. Please uh, proceed. Um, right. So uh, I I should uh, first uh, uh, confess that uh, I am only two months old in uh, the skill development and employment uh, sphere. You know, like I, for the past uh, three years, I had been working in the energy sphere, and uh, only previous experience that I have something on something related to employment is. Uh, my previous stint in uh, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, uh, where I had been commissioner in the state for about a year. So uh, what I uh, propose to speak about is uh, the manner in which I am able to see and appreciate the situation in the last two months, uh, the challenge that I uh, see in front of me, so that uh, maybe uh, this uh, panel discussion can act as a forum for generating uh, more uh, perspectives onto uh, the challenge uh, that is uh, that, uh, that is being faced. Uh, one, one uh, of course, like I think the all, all of the panelists are uh, on the same page in this that like we have a really uh, exponentially changing world uh, scenario. Like uh, the economic scenario is very rapidly changing and exponentially changing. I would say so. It is very difficult to imagine that a particular skill is going to uh, stay uh, put as uh, one that would uh, uh, reap a livelihood for uh, the all of the years to come. So it, the requirement for uh, the skilled workforce, uh, the actual skill that is required is also changing. And um, it would not be very uh, misplaced to um, actually view it in this manner that some of the skilling uh, that we do uh, perhaps results in a bit of unemployment as well because uh, even we are um, skilling somebody who is already employed um, like it is uh, certainly important because it increases the productivity of the nation as a whole but uh, it would certainly uh, lead to some amount of unemployment as uh, as well uh, and uh, some of the employment also leads to more skilling as in the case of apprenticeship and uh, some of the employment actually leads to de-skilling also but when it is unskilled labor as uh, perhaps we try and provide in the case of national rural employment at scheme. So it, it's, a, it's a curious um, mix of uh, multiple contradicting realities that we have uh, when we address uh, the space of skilling. So there needs to be, I believe, a perspective in which uh, we um, we have a very special problem in the sense that like uh, humanity has not done this before um, walking into such kind of an exponential world, uh, rapidly changing world, um, uh, with uh, so many billion pe people's uh, pe uh, uh, like future at stake. So this is something that like we have not done before. So we perhaps need to have some uh, new, uh, new thought um, as far as uh, the skilling uh, perspective is concerned. So one one thought uh, was that like can we can we think of skilling? as a generic uh, social security net rather than uh, like uh, it, it can it be uh, can it be uh, as generic social security net that we provide uh, for people uh, to bounce back into the economy uh, so that uh, uh, whenever there is uh, whenever there is a requirement for the skilling so that the person gets uh, back into livelihood 
uh, that is available as a social generic social security net and that it could be such kind of an intervention rather than having sector specific bandages um, uh, uh, we could have a generic social security net uh, which is formed through skilling and also the um, what uh, raf foundation also was mentioning about uh, the importance of uh, perhaps linking skilling to social value creation and uh, also the local environmental realities also needs to be taken care of because like it would be uh, it would be most important i believe to provide uh, for uh, livelihood opportunities in the same circumstances or in the without uh, without much of displacement without much of um, uh, um, people having to move from their own locations if uh, that would be afforded that would be the best course so like these are some of the uh, parameters that we are uh, thinking about when we uh, think about this uh, aspect of universal social engagement so engagement uh, in the sense that engagement would uh, in, would be encompassing the term of employment or uh, skilling and uh, maybe even a little bit of entrepreneurship uh, so that like they can be uh, they can be uh, taking it um, uh, forward themselves um, in in the case of um, taking their lives forward so these aspects of equity and justice uh, environmental sustainability i believe uh, needs to be uh, needs to be brought into the aspect of skilling and um, i stay open to any um, any suggestions in this regard we are uh, in the process of uh, starting a pilot project in one of the villages where we can offer uh, skilling as a generic social security net uh, so that like there could be an assurance of um, uh, assurance that can be given so that uh, everybody would be at least getting uh, getting uh, unskilled uh, wage uh, rate as an income uh, stream so uh, this is just a thought process and uh, i stay open to any uh, any inputs in this regard Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Raghuraji. Uh, such a pleasure to listen to you and to see the work that you're doing, hear about it. A very good presentation. I'm sure that we will continue our conversations so that uh, we can also learn from you and we can also explain to you what we are doing and how we are uh, doing it and how we are scaling it up in different parts of the country. Uh, now, it is my distinct honor to introduce Sri Kalyan Chakravarti. Uh, he is a pioneering uh, graduate from the IITs also. Uh, the convergence, he is pioneering the convergence of governments and markets, the two transformative forces of our times. He strives to bring the best in the class, IIT like Ivy League spirit to public vocational and livelihood education architecture exclusively for the underprivileged through non-profit joint ventures with the state. He led the making of India's first non-profit social unicorn thanks to one of the best teams in the impact sector in India. This is absolutely amazing, Kalyan. Uh, Kalyan specializes, specialties include designing public systems for the poor, social business, impact bonds, micro equity, non-profit public-private partnerships, and of course, the very famous mantra of Samaj, Sarkar, and Bazaar, that is society, state, and markets collaboration. Uh, Kalyanji, Parfi initiative in the state of Jharkhand seems to have cracked the code of an ideal social impact venture with scale. Public-private partnership, with operating autonomy, industry participation to ensure good paying jobs and self-sustainability. And Dr. Manish Kumar has also referred to the outstanding work you have been doing in his presentation. Uh, we request you to elaborate on the key unique aspects of this phenomenal vocational innovation, including the aspects of its sustainability, replicability, and growth path. You have seven to eight minutes. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador uh, Kapoor. It's always wonderful to be in the wheels uh, uh, webinars. And, uh, you know, I'm in a very en an envious position because I have Manish, who was one of my, I would say, ex-boss or ex-investors. And I have Mr. Raghuraj, who is actually currently uh, one of our directors. I have to follow them. So that's not a, <laughs> that's a very difficult task to do, but I'll do my best. So what I thought is instead of me talking, I just have a quick 
uh, you know, video from the ground that kind of sets the perspective. And I have a few slides to just uh, clear it up. I'll uh, adhere to the time limit. So in the interest of time, let me just straight away get into that. And, uh, you know, we will, uh, you know, just uh, get started. Yeah. One of the biggest challenges India faces is in the area of providing equal opportunities to all sections of society. Skill development is one initiative which brings equal opportunities to all. Pan IIT alumni reach for India Foundation, headquartered at IIT Bombay, partners with state governments through non-profit, joint venture enterprises to create an institutionalized skill development architecture exclusively for the underserved across all districts of the state. The first such special purpose vehicle or SPV was created with agencies of welfare of the government of Jharkhand. The PAN IIT model of skill development is predicated on a short placement, 100% skill loan financing, best in class training and residential infrastructure led by ex-army personnel. The foundation and runs gurukuls with 2 to 3 month training in construction, logistics, manufacturing and kaushal colleges imparting 1 to 2 years of trade licenses vocational education in trades like nursing, catering exclusively for the underserved. When we are dealing with skilling of the vulnerable, we need to bring in the best in the system. So, in other words, if one has to create an IIT ecosystem for skilling, this is perhaps the best way. ये नर्सिंग कौशल कॉलेज है और मेरी फैमिली कंडीशन उतना अच्छा नहीं है कि इसमें लोन प्रोसेस के द्वारा पढ़ाई कराई जाती है जिसमें कि घर से पैसे नहीं लगते हैं कॉलेज बहुत अच्छा है क्योंकि इसमें फैसिलिटीज ज्यादा हैं और यहां थ्योरी क्लास के साथ-साथ प्रैक्टिस पर ज्यादा ध्यान दिया जाता है कि इसमें हाई टेक्नोलॉजी के द्वारा पढ़ाया जाता है जैसे कि सिमुलेटर है यहां वार्ड बनाए गए हैं जैसे प्रैक्टिस वार्ड है आईसीयू वार्ड है मैं फर्स्ट स्टेट टॉपर रही हूं और यह मेरे लिए बिग अपॉर्चुनिटी है these four primary investors of Prayogi Foundation have come together to create this not-for-profit that will provide linkages in the form of markets, finance, technology support, as well as capacity building for artisans and collectives in rural India in a very unique manner. So, in this model, where 51% of the equity is owned by the rural collectives and artisans through their sweat equity. We, for the first time, are promoting democratized equity ownership at the grassroots level in India. Thus, of capital contribute to unleash the potential of micro equity social impact fund is being created with SIDB. the social impact fund is a sebi category one alternative investment fund which pools grant funds from multiple sources such as government agencies venture philanthropists multilateral agencies etc this acts as a revolving corpus for micro equity investments into various worker-owned village collectives and producer enterprises. The capital from exits of these enterprises will be reinvested in other enterprises. So that kind of summarizes the work we do. So honestly, uh, that kind of really was my pitch, but uh, in the, I have another couple of three, four minutes. So I'll just quickly reiterate some of the points which were made. And I think, uh, 
amb uh, ambassador uh, you specifically alluded to as i was saying that the idea is to bring the iit and or the ib league spirit into vocational and mass entrepreneurship education and we do this by genuinely uh, being uh, you know very very closely knit with samaj sarkar and bazar which means uh, society government and markets uh, especially through a non profit joint venture model with the state and that's where uh, we have had fantastic uh, experience with uh, both manish and of course currently uh, you know mr raj so it's been a great uh, experience and the idea of this is that while the state is there as a passive investor the autonomy is retained by the, the the joint venture we are the majority partners and we are impact led and market based so we kind of try to get the best of all worlds put together right of course it's had had phenomenal results in jharkhand um as you can see uh, it's there practically in every district of jharkhand we do with them 50000 plus kids every year 10000 plus kids and growing number are actually kind of uh, passing out of this we are now in the anvil of setting up a skill university so it's going exceedingly well and uh, you know so we have practically kind of uh, become the de facto state uh, occasional educational and livelihood education system just to give you a case study of that lady you saw that geeta kumari this is her home she is a daughter of a farmer just who was earning 2 to 3 dollars a day and with this intervention geeta kumari could actually manage to get about 300 dollars a month as her salary post the two year uh, nursing education course so that's the kind of uh, phenomenal impact uh, this has been uh, possible to have and um, you know our uh, in fact uh, very lightly manish sir mentioned about the achilles heel in the entire uh, skilling system which is of retention and post placement uh, behavior we've had phenomenal uh, experience we are part of the impact bond we are i think we believe we are one of the leading uh, partners there we've had 90% plus uh, repayment is also similar 90% plus so i think given an, i think the short point i want to just and we've done the same thing now we're trying to replicate in madhya pradesh uh, and uh, under the guidance of raghuraj ji uh, these are the kind of some of the structures that are coming up we've already launched the first few centers and now we are replicating it to bihar assam and uttar pradesh which are the low hd states in the country i think the short point i want to this is the last slide from my side i just want to say that you know when poor are given and this is important to understand if we give poor the best in class vocational education which is the privilege we all had from various institutions that we've studied they would absolutely shine in the same passion and we have done that with garib yuva antyodai nari and we've had uh, you know uh, app audited uh, you know third party verified results which actually say the same thing and the bankers are obviously providing the due diligence by closing the banking cycle so i think this is the last point i would say that we do development with market based principles then the political case which is getting jobs to the poor the impact case which is actually making livelihood transformation and it's honestly the the division of labor in this is that the government gives capex one time and we manage the ongoing operational expenditure through the skill loan model so it all comes together and it really works so at least in our case we can say we've had phenomenal uh, you know experience with government so i must thank anish jayanti ma'am we are doing some pilots in gujarat and uh, as all the you know bureaucrats on panel i've only been delightful to work with so i can only thank them and uh, you know appreciate it so please do your best and uh, support us uh, in building india's largest public vocation and livelihood education architecture so that's it from my side thank you thank you so very much kalyan uh, this is absolutely amazing work and your beautiful video which you played earlier was like going on a roller skater ride you know uh, you are able to achieve uh, such a massive amount of scale because of uh, associating with the state governments and associating with the banks and also because of your uh, loan model it makes it very sustainable these are absolutely exemplary you know templates for other organizations also thank you so much thank you thank you thank you man thank now you. i will come to our next speaker uh dr jayanti ravi uh it is my pleasure to introduce her uh, i have known her for many years and it has been such a great pleasure to be associated with such a uh, outstanding individual uh, she is an ias officer of the 1991 batch but she is also a scientist a performing vocalist a thinker and widely traveled development practitioner she is currently the additional chief secretary revenue in the government of gujarat 
and holding the concurrent charge of Secretary of Orwell Foundation. Dr. Jayati Ravi has had myriad realms of experience in her multifaceted career. Passion for human development and service to humanity best describes her mission. She holds a master's degree in nuclear physics from the University of Madras, MPA from Harvard University, and a PhD in technology enhanced education, uh, conceptualizing a multiversity from MS University, Baroda. She's also the author of several books, which include Sanity and Sanitation, Symphony of Fraternity, Social Empower Enterprise for Human Upliftment Model, uh, which we are also using in Gujarat in Arabli, and Silver Lining, Insights into Gujarat. Uh, Dr. Jayanti Raviji, you have had unique leadership roles in driving livelihood programs across a large state, as well as leading a highly respected humanitarian institution along with your husband, Ravi Gopalan, who also runs a private enterprise called Argue Soft and does a lot of philanthropic work in large areas, including UP, Damandiu, Gujarat, etc. Please share with us your insights on the role of policy, on the role of empathy, and on the role of technology in solving livelihood challenges at scale. You have seven to eight minutes. Over to you, Dr. Jayanti Ravi. Namaste. Good morning. Good evening to all of you. I hope I'm audible by a show of hand, maybe. Okay. Thank you, Rajiv, and thank you, everybody. I think it was wonderful to hear this this wonderful uh, panel of people, including my dear friend, batchmate Manish, and of course, um, Rajendran ji, and also Kalyan, with whom I mean, I've, I've heard and seen some of his work as well. I just want to take you all back to an experience that I had some years back. Some of us, you know, tend to sometimes still question some things with a bit of, I wouldn't use the word cynicism, but we tend to critically look at some things to really wonder if this is true. This was perhaps seven years ago in a small village in Chota Udaipur Taluka. Now it's a full-fledged district and it was also just about carved into a new district back then, a very predominantly tribal belt of Gujarat. And there was a little village where I was sitting with the women of that village, predominantly from the minority community, Muslim girls and women. And I had purposely asked some of the other people from the government machinery to stay out. It was a classroom and I thought I would have a conversation with them because we were in the business or in the work of actually constructing toilets, individual household latrines for really transforming what till then was a shame for, for many of us, for all of us. India had the notorious distinction of being the open defecation capital of the world where nearly 50 to 60% of the country's population was squatting and defecating in the open. So we had to take up this big mission of building toilets, but it was not just about defunct, dead toilets, brick and mortar structures, but it was about building toilets here, bringing about a behavior change and getting them to use the toilets. So you had to really take this in a big way where the people were to be involved. So these women were a part of something called Swachita, Shilpis, which neatly translates into something like sanitation sculptors. They were sculptors, sculptors not just for the brick and mortar structure that we call a toilet, but also the behavior change that was needed for people to start using toilets. So I remember questioning them, how do you build it? Because there was a bit of cynicism in me, a, a bit of uh, critical. I was not very sure that they were the women making these toilet designs. And I asked them, how do you build? What is the diameter? What is the depth? How do you make the junction box? And I must say, by the end of that interaction of about nearly 30 minutes, where I quizzed them almost like a strict teacher trying to do a cold calling and call out anybody, I had tears in my eyes. And the same point with a few minutes Kalyan made, and all of us, I think, um, have made it this, that there is another India, there is a significant India, if only they too get the kind of opportunities that many of us got 
if you just made things, you know, this intergenerational affirmative action, these are women from a marginalized section, sometimes socially, economically. And if they're just given some skills, ideas, how to and empower them with this, they can really, and then what we saw was magic. Village after village, a lot of these groups came together, started building toilets, and it really gave them a newfound confidence, empowerment. And we thought with these skills, they could then be leveraged also for other skills. We had the Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana, which is really building houses for, a, you know, almost like village-wise, you had about 1,000 uh, 500 to 1,000 houses to be built, which also meant a lot of work for them. So coming back to this, I had a small set of slides. This is not something original, but I just thought if it's okay with you, I can quickly uh, show you something. So these women, what is the connection to skills? I hope you can see this. It so happens that all of these women that we were working with across the state came from something called the R SETIs. Our CETIs is an acronym. Of course, a lot of this whole space and skill and development is full of alphabet soups, as I would say, acronyms, different. So our CETI is Rural Self-Employment Training Institutes. Now, you have a very interesting model here. The, the credit of this actually goes back to a gentleman called Mr. Hegde, Santosh Hegde, if I remember his name right, was later decorated with the Padma Shri. He partnered way back in 1982 with the Canara Bank to see that a lot of loans that were being given would actually end up being, I'm running through these slides because this is uh, just, just an idea of what all it entails, but I want to cover a little more. So the idea was when you give loans to people for self-employment, a lot of them end up as bad loans. So if there's a way that the bank can fortify the people who are being given these skills and the money with certain skills, including soft skills that Manish spoke of, which is increasingly important behavior change and almost in a gurukulam like setting. If you see here, the slide here, it talks of the gurukul system. It was not a come in the morning and go back in the evening. So they had to actually sit with this whole mix of hard skills and soft skills. So this was the whole model where they had to go through all of this. And uh, uh, so the bankers would be, would be in the backyard of the bank, so to say, not that it's physically located right there. But the bankers had the responsibility of ensuring that the people were trained. And those that were trained with this, it was for men, women, it is still there, for men, women, young people of all communities, ages, but particularly for rural areas, and then give them the loans. The possibility of these uh, financial assistance of it really becoming a bad loan gets much less. I mean, the, the possibility is much less. So this is, these were some of the criteria that you have people from the Menrega card holders. I mean, I don't want to, the slide is available. But what is interesting is about 592 such centers which were set up. And if you see it state-wise, if we just talk of Gujarat, almost, we are 33 districts, but there were 28 of such are SETI centers. And if you see the number of people trained, and it's a program which is still going on, so it's an initiative which started not from the government, but it was an individual, somebody who was really like wheels, like all of you, each one of you in wheels was passionate about skilling those, that entire, that part of India, which was for some reason not given the privilege of this. And then he saw dramatic results. And then that small idea of an individ individual then panned out to became a pan-India program. And you can see the sectors where this is happening and how many people have been. And now I take special pride in this picture that you see on the left. So this happened in Gujarat, um, you know, when we had a big uh, event at uh, Mahatma Mandir, which is our center here. And then this lady that you see here, Ramila Ben Gami, Gamit, she is a lady who got, got the Swachhata Shakti Award from the Honorable Prime Minister that year for making the maximum number of toilets. So you can see her demeanor as she receives this award. Somebody who came from a very ordinary um, household in a small village in a tribal district, but then she, the confidence that she got. So this is something I wanted to share. So the programs that we have in the government, there are a large number of them for skilling. So this is at one end of the spectrum, which is called RCETI in partnership with banks. Of course, it depends on the leadership there, on the bank managers, 
the person who's the RCT coordinator, typically from a bank, and the way they work uh, dovetail or in coordination with the districts, and it can make a remarkable difference. But in the same breath, we also have another program. I'm going to quickly run you through, if I have time, for another effort, which is another end of the spectrum called the Deen Dayal Upadhyay um, Livelihood Scheme. Let me just see if I can get that. So this is also, if we have a minute or two, because just to give you a flavor of what is it. So I think we're starting from the end. I'm going to quickly go to the top. So this is, if you look at skills evolution in government of India, you started with the, um, the, the SGSY is what where it all began. This uh, The Swarna Jayanti Gram Swarojgar Yojana. I mean, that's one of, of course, even before that you had IRDP for many years. And then different names, modifications of the program. But this happened somewhere in 2014. I wouldn't claim that these are silver bullets that have solved all the pro uh, problems and challenges. But I, it's for all of you to also understand that policy too goes through all these evolutionary processes of learning from the feedback loop, seeing what works, what doesn't, and increasingly with greater empathy for different levels. So here, greater sensitivity greater leveraging of technology. So this is more of a private partnership mode of implementation. We were implementing it in Gujarat. And there was also a mandatory coverage for people from the marginalized uh, segments, scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, 50% minority, 15 women, and also people with disability. And what you see here, the unique features, for example, dedicated manpower for this community late mobilization drive, and you'll also find provisions. There was a free uniform. I remember that the men and women in these programs were given a morph colored, a light purple colored uniform, which also really increased their confidence. They would be given technology tablets during training and free residential boarding of a fairly good quality, reasonable quality with a mobile tracking system of everyone and also one-time travel costs. So this is how things have evolved. But that is not to say that everything is hunky-dory. We still have a lot of work to do. But these are some of the eligibility criteria, mobilization of candidates. How is it that this Kaushal Panji, so at the end of it, how many skilled people that we have? This is a kind of registration across the states, the incentives, monitoring and evaluation. What is the method we have? Hands-on training with a lot of equipment where the private sector also comes in. So I just wanted to give you two different flavors of what all happens in government. Of course, there's a lot in between too. But just to say that on the one hand, we have uh, schemes like this. Did I? Did you see it or did I share it at all with you or did I not share this part with you? No, I think the, I missed... the slides did not show up. That's did okay. Not show up. But that's okay. I think I've yeah, covered okay. my I'll seven be... minutes time. I don't want to eat up the time. But again, thank you. And I'm really looking forward wheels as Ambassador uh, Pradeep Kapoorji mentioned, I mean, it's a privilege that we're all working very closely in villages in Aravalli and also with the Badri Foundation and all of it. And I, it's been a privilege for me to be associated with all of you for all these years. But I think it'll be a great idea to also leverage some of these schemes, like what we just saw, the Arseti. And I've often uh, said, even when we last time met online at the uh, Banaras Hindu, at the BHU, Banaras, the IIT Banaras, when we had the conference, that just as we working in um, Aravalli, I'm also now Secretary Auroville. It's not that the names are phonetically sounding similar, but we have about 700 units there, right from making some of the best top end confectionery that you'll have in Austria and Vienna, the top uh, anywhere in the world, or incense sticks, candles, and so many things that solar energy, there's so much that is happening. So if we can look at the entire spectrum from the absolute semi-skilled, unskilled to the really sophisticated. There's a lot of need for skills, not only for within the country, but all of a lot of these skilled resources can also be exported out. I mean, when we talk of this huge population burden, one way of looking at it is like a burden. But I think I, I've always been someone who is a little optimistic, notwithstanding sometimes what may seem like a challenge. I think it's a great opportunity if this demographic dividend can really be used to export and send out good quality human resources across the world. It would be a win-win situation for all. And on that note, again, thank you and congratulations to all of you.
for the wonderful work you're all doing. Namaste. Namaste, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jayanti ji. It's such a pleasure always, so fascinating. And how can we ever forget that the entire Arabli project was born out of our discussions with you in the US, in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. And uh, we thank you for the cooperation which we keep on receiving from Sarjan Foundation on the field also on a day-to-day -day basis. So, and we look forward to expanding the footprint. We are going to be launching the livelihood phase of the program also. The digital learning lab has been going very well, expanding very significantly. So a lot of initiatives are moving ahead, but uh, we are now looking forward to even uh, further expansion through EN's projects and other projects. So now I have the distinct honor to invite our next speaker on the panel, uh, Shri Arun Jain, who I have known very closely for many decades. Arun is the founder and chairman of Intellect, the founder of non-profit Mission Samriddhi and is also a design thinking practitioner who has created a lot of uh, new thoughts on critical design thinking and implementation and execution. And his workshops on design thinking are absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, he's also a teacher. Uh, intellect helps global financial institutions with state-of-the-art technologies and products. And I've been associated with them for many years now. And I've seen their phenomenal work all over the world and all the continents in the national digital financial infrastructure space. Concurrently, Arun is also leading Mission Samridhi, a social impact enterprise striving towards empowering rural India in solving its problems through design thinking again. Mission Samriddhi is working across 87 clusters in eight states, covering 500 villages with the population of about 1.5 million. This is just a brief overview. He's also doing a lot of work with other organizations such as Ulas Trust. But the you know, time uh, aspect we have to keep in mind. So I am going to now request uh, Sri Arunji to you know, share with our audience how Mission Samriddhi strives towards empowering rural India in solving their problems through design thinking. Thank you. Over to you. You have seven to eight minutes. Thank you, Ambassador Pradeep Kapoor and all the speakers, Manish, Sarika, Raghuraj, Kalyan, Jayanti Raviji, uh, to bring multiple perspective of livelihood. I like to share a story. Last week, uh, we were visiting Delhi and entered into a store called Tanera, which is a Tata enterprise. And uh, we saw a sari from Magan Khadi, which they were selling at 9,000 rupees. And this is the initiative which we took in Mission Samaritan in 2016, eight years back. Can we change the mindset of the small Khadi unit to create a design patterns and design quality, which can be sold in best of the quality and increase the income, not just by labor uh, skill development, but by creating a design pattern, which is uh, sold at the premium pricing more than silk sari. So handloom sari more than silk sari. So we keep on discussing about khadi should be cheaper and it should be 200 rupees a meter. There's a person called Mukesh there in last six, eight years of his design thinking workshops he attended. Today he had a confidence to design those patterns, uh, which is being sold in a market in Fab India. Or... So my thought is, if you look at it in Australia, there's a company called Canva, there's a company called Procreate, there's a company called Atlassian. These companies come from a small villages of the Australia. They are not really big, big towns or big cities they are coming from. The creativity is a is not a prerogative of the urban India. It's a, why can't a Canva coming from Australia when there is no selling market there and able to reach to global world by digital market, digital technologies. Today we have the access of digital markets for everybody which, is, which makes us equal. So if wheat is produced in a village in agriculture community and we are selling at 20 rupees a kg while ATA we are purchasing in urban India is purchased at 150 rupees a kg, 
there's a gap of 20 rupees to 150 rupees. If 50% gap can be given to the villager, I think they can, each farmer can have a much better income for to share among all of it. So I think we need to look at it, the livelihood problem from a holistic perspective. When we look at holistic perspective, first is a belief, my personal belief, whether we can achieve or whether we can't achieve. Second is, which is we call development block one. First, we need to do the development block on the community that they can do it. I can do it. Second thing is social development. What is the horizon of our planning for the livelihood? Is it a horizon one, which is a five year, horizon two, which is a 15 year, horizon three, which is a 25 years. Whatever is to be done, we need to look at our education system is not a replica of urban system to the rural system. It has to be more confidence building and belief building at the age of five, six, seven, eight in the rural India, because each district is a two million people. It's like a country in Europe. A two million people has a, its own market. We need to look at it whether village or the district or the block is exporter of the money or importer of the money. As soon as we start looking the economy of the rural India as in, in terms of import and export, today we are finding a lot of gutka goes to village, which consumes three crore rupees per village on one gutka item. They pay 60 lakh rupees GST on it. And we say that we are paying a panchayat, GPDP is being paid by the government and their GPDP is less than 20 lakh rupees. But villager is paying 60 lakh rupees for the G good guy itself. So I think that we need to start questioning. This is a good forum wheels has started, Ambassador, where we are dialoguing this with the open mindset that do we need to look at, we, do we want to create a labor force out of 100 uh, for a billion people or 900 million people you talked about, or we want to create an entrepreneurship in the villages because the, today with the roads infrastructure so beautifully coming up, digital infrastructure coming up, how are they connected to market? How the rural market, which is all the FMCG company which are selling over there, why can't they produce their own product of the quality which we see saw in Tanera in the rural India? Why can't they have a wheat, which is a native seed wheat, which is grown over there with a protein content of 11% wheat can be sold at three rupees, like 300 rupees a kg in an organic market in the global India, and they should sell from that marketplace, not from anywhere else. So I think these are the few things which we are looking at it. If we have a, so when we look at the economic model as a holistic level, we look at it that how many different things are required for driving the change. So we look at this slide, which I'm sharing with you. They are, first block is what is my, Consumption, which is there, lo local production. What is the, what they produce locally? There are so many of things like 31 elements they are producing locally. How will they get the right price? If they get the three times the price, which is the difference between they produce and what we consume, 50% can be substantially increase the livelihood money in the village. So the export money will increase in the village. Similarly, for small scale industries, can they be what is told as a MSME, startup ecosystem. When I'm discussing with startup Tamil Nadu, what is the startup ecosystem of uh, rural India? We talk about fintech companies in urban cities. What is the rural India startup ecosystem? So when we spend some design thinking time with the Tamil Nadu systems, we found there's a strong opportunity of building a startup Tamil Nadu at rural India. Then we have a professional uh, skills, what NSDC and PARFI is doing a brilliant job. We should integrate with it. Then what kind of trading they are doing? Trading import into the village, whether this import is how much import should be allowed. Then you have services which are there. So the huge amount of services, which is again skill based. And then how do we add the value by the packaging pickup with the local markets? So these are the few uh, areas which uh, could be of value. If you create a framework of uh, 100 such skill together, and then we look at it, various uh, organizations and NGO which are working, like what Sarika was mentioning about uh, need-based uh, income design is a very, very important aspect of design thinking. 
and this design thinking uh, area where we say first you design the thinking of the villager build the belief in them and then you do thinking the design for the livelihood don't consider them as a labor force consider them a human being who has the same capacity as what we are sitting in iit and iims and their thinking capacity is not lower than what our thinking process is i am not undermining iit and iim contribution to the economy but the villager has they understand their own problems they understand their problem better than what we understand them because they they have grown up on that that soil and that soil they know it better than we know it and let's not impose our system if we can enable them to think and believe that they can solve their own problem like the way we, all of us sitting in this room are also middle class families they, we solve the problem ourselves let them enable that with the wheels foundation and all of us coming together can make a huge difference in it with a horizon of h1 h2 h3 horizon 1 five, five years but i would like to focus on horizon 2 which is 15 years because a lot of work has to be done for 15 year horizon where each district will become like a, a small european country and that's what my dream is thank you thank you thank you so much arunji what a brilliant uh, exposition absolutely outstanding and your thoughts about uh, driving in come up through cooperatives through you know organic farms which you have been creating and so much of practical work you are doing on the ground you are you know thinking about time horizons about um, education which is more confidence building and uh, belief building and also so many works which are not mentioned here including the uh, you know absolutely amazing eye hospital in kekra district in the rural area state of the art eye hospital so you keep on doing work very quietly uh, but uh, very impact in a very impactful manner we thank you for that and uh, i also want to say that uh, there are a lot of comments a lot of questions a lot of uh, you know, interventions by various people asking for a recording. Yes, recording will be available on the YouTube in our channel, wheelsglobal.org. And for working together with Wheels and the other partner organizations here, uh, it is very easy for us to link up with you or for you to link up with us uh, through the website. So we look forward to expanding that also. And there are, uh, since there are too many questions, we are going to limit uh, it to just a few questions currently and I'll request the speakers to limit their responses to over two minutes. We are extending our time now in view of the questions and answers to 11.30. Uh, so the first question uh, which I would like to address to Dr. Manish Kumar is that uh, busy people have a variety of tasks, paid work and unpaid domestic work to do while the unemployed have no work and hence a lot of time. By outsourcing such domestic tasks to the unemployed, unskilled, less knowledgeable people, the unemployment problem and economic problems can be addressed to a great extent. Do you agree that by providing tax incentives, government can incentivize such methods? Uh, Dr. Manish. So I wouldn't say that you know we necessarily require government for all of these things. One simple way by which we could do this is you know, almost everybody has household help in India. I mean, uh, if you're affluent. And you'll notice that India has almost 80%, 85% informal worker, people who don't have any contractual agreement. And that leads to problem of its own because they can't access capital. They can't access bank loans. They can't access anything. They don't have rights. So if we can, on our own, begin as a social movement itself, maybe supported by pan IIT, that people begin to give contracts to people who are working as helpers or drivers, which are such large in numbers in cities, most of India, in urban cities, but none of them are formal. All of them are informal. So at this stage, I think we should start with that rather than look towards the government. And probably if we succeed a bit, then government will step in because it has its own social dimensions too, right? So the, <laughs> the, the regulatory part of it, it's actually a crime not to be doing that. Right. If any of the other panelists want to comment quickly on this. I'd appreciate that. And if uh, we are all okay, then I'll move on to the next one. Arun, are you raising your hand on that? No, 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 it's okay. Okay, okay thank you. So um, the next question uh, is on circularity, which says that with sustainability and circularity as key imperatives, how is the government or the NGOs working to develop 
local economic models that enable communities to achieve sustainable consumption and local employment. I would request uh, Dr. Jayanti Ravi to respond to this because uh, she has uh, run uh, an NGO also and she's in the government also. Uh, over to you, Dr. Jayanti Ravi. Is Dr. Jayanti there or? Uh, I think huh? she's uh, disconnected. I think she's not. We can have Dr. Sarika. Sarika yeah, Dr. That. Sarika Kulkani, can we request you to take that? Yeah, yeah, sure, definitely. So, uh, so when I mentioned that we have these two types of models for women livelihood, one is the individual women and second is the group businesses. The individual model is essentially aimed at uh, uh, the local economy. That what are the, so we do a lot of market uh, mapping to understand what are the needs of the local economy and then create this uh, uh, individual women entrepreneurship model to fulfill those needs. Like, uh, for example, we have lots of women who have started business of blacksmith because there was a need for blacksmithry, you know, kind of those services in the local economy. And so that demand supply gap we could fulfill through these women. Similarly, um, uh, financial inclusion was a big challenge that we saw. And uh, we realized that one of the reasons why people were not using banks that effectively was because the banks were located in Taluka headquarters and people were living very far away. And to use the bank, they had to compromise on a day's income. You know, uh, and uh, so clearly there was a huge gap that we saw and we fulfilled that gap by creating women financial advisors and the banking correspondent plus plus. And these women, they are equipped with the smartphones and a device uh, which uh, uh, uses biometric to uh, connect to their uh, bank accounts. And these women actually facilitate basic banking transaction and charge a very small transaction fee. Now, this has actually is a phenomenal model to not only bo boost the local economy, but also create, make the communities financially secure, financially inclusion, uh, financial inclusion is happening. Communities are becoming more resilient because now part, they are part of the uh, you know, uh, part of the uh, whole system, the banking system, and they can avail of a lot of benefits. And importantly, women are getting livelihood opportunities through this. So the basic banking transaction, they, these women also facilitate basic e the ration card or even facilitating basic uh, government schemes like solar scheme, energy related scheme or some other schemes for farmers, farmer agri insurance. All of that is also taught to these women and again against a small commission these women facilitate these transactions. So our whole attempt has been that how do we improve the local economy by creating opportunities that will cater to the local economy. Now, similarly, you know, some uh, very interesting uh, uh, examples. Again, I will not take much time. In case of agriculture, our farmers are uh, not only selling in the local market, but also the farmer collective is selling in the urban market. But this is improving the income of the farmer, which is giving rise to a lot of other businesses. For example, our farmers, if they are buying motorcycles, I suddenly saw a motor motorcycle repairing shop opening in a rural area. And I was wondering that, you know, who's the, why is this guy opening this shop? And I realized that a lot of these farmers have, their incomes have improved. They have bought two wheelers and clearly there was a need for starting a service station. So there are a lot of these allied uh, complementary and supplementary business opportunities that are creating, that are getting created because of our whole focus on improving the incomes of the farmers and improving the women incomes. I hope thank I have you. answered the question. Yes, thank you very much. I have answered it very well. But uh, since you are on the screen currently, can I also request you to answer the next question? Yeah, sure. Uh, can we translate ecological restoration to livelihoods for the communities? Absolutely. I'm glad uh, this question was asked. Uh, <laughs> so we have two types of programs that uh, we do to exactly achieve this. One is uh, agroforestry. Now, agroforestry is a very, very interesting program. Uh, which is, we actually call it a agro biodiversity uh, kind of an initiative where it falls exactly in between uh, ecology and income, income for farmers and ecological improvement. And uh, so here we also do a lot of, we work with the grasses. Now grasses also improve the soil quality and soil, as we know, is a great form, uh, you know, it sequesters a lot of carbon. So that is one. And the second, when we do this large scale afforestation program where we are working on hundreds of acres, like 600 acre at a time, 
there also we ensure that about 30 to 35 percent of the crops that we plant are income generating crops they are uh, so rest are all native trees and about 30 to 35 percent crops are all uh, they provide income to the farmers income to the communities also we work a lot on herbs shrubs grasses like vetiver also provide a lot of income now vetiver is a very interesting grass it not only uh, ensures that the soil doesn't uh, erode and it also absorbs a lot of moisture and provides a lot of moisture to the crop as when it is growing but importantly vetiver has a lot of usage in uh, the mushroom industry so uh, again that can be sold by the farmers and vetiver is once you plant it the roots are so deep that it regenerates you know even if you cut from the top it kind of resurfaces and regenerates so that's a great <laughs> income opportunity so in fact all our uh, rejuvenation programs and biodiversity re uh, revival programs have a very important element of uh, uh, income livelihoods for the communities so that they uh, ensure that so you know once the commercial you build a commercial angle to any program uh, you know it is always taken right. care of extremely yes. well well thank you and there is so much of learning in what you are doing and what everybody else is doing for uh, you know enhancing our impact mutually also uh, the next question which i will make it the last question because we are running out of time we have a few other important questions but uh, this one is for uh, raguraj rajendra and i hope your it and network is good because the question is also related to it what is the role that you see for it in livelihoods programs in madhya pradesh and uh, also about uh, the skills initiative involving regional industry to predict job requirements to align skills to market demands a market aligned skills development program uh, would probably be more impactful uh, and there is already a working model with parfi and uh, can be adopted at a greater scale with in other states also and uh, you know maybe at the central level also uh, over to you raguraj ji absolutely i think the it is a great space to be providing much more of empowerment as well as employment and i think the there's a focus on services that can provide more of employment even in the upcoming conference of chief secretaries so like it's it's a it's, a, it's an important area and steadily there could be a uh, gain in uh, uh, generally improving the access to technology technical education um, for uh, people uh, especially students uh, who are looking for employment uh, in their uh, near future so and uh, for the uh, aspect of market oriented uh, skill development uh, interventions I, i think it's a very uh, important aspect that uh, we uh, kind of tailor our efforts uh, to uh, be serving the market in this sense that uh, the courses that we pick to take forward and uh, should be should be aligned to the uh, market demand absolutely thank you right thank you so much and um, thank you, you to one question the... uh, pradeep ji just one question to so because we got a manish ji and raguraj ji from government system and jenti ji Mm -hmm. uh how do we connect the education ministry livelihood ministry and together to look at it a change uh, at a larger level uh, because all the thing belief system has to be built in a education we are imposing urban education system to rural education education system and making them labor not self employed uh, entrepreneurs so do we have any process in which multi ministries can work together under one umbrella or under task force so uh, like uh, uh, one uh, aspect is that the continuum of skill and education is very difficult uh, to distinguish in the sense that uh, we are actually talking about a skilling in uh, the national education policy in a big manner so uh, the continuum is very difficult to distinguish um, and uh, I, i suspect that the skilling activities uh, has to have their presence in education institutions and education of course like uh, on a larger uh, sphere i suppose cannot be looked at from the limited perspective of career alone it has to be for education uh, it has to be a perspective of education for life rather than career so um, uh, but you uh, you have a very valid point uh, that uh, uh, there should be a holistic approach towards the whole aspect the human resources 
uh, aspect uh, needs to be brought in uh, when uh, integrating the efforts of the different departments. Uh, in fact, there are multiple departments which are uh, which are working on the different aspects of education, technical education, and uh, even higher education. Like uh, at times, uh, there are two different departments looking at it, as as it is in the case of uh, Madhya Pradesh. So there is always a case that like there should be an integrated approach. Uh, some some systemic measure so that like there is an integrated approach to, on uh, the uh, different aspects of education. Thank you, thank you so much, and thank you, Arun, thank you. for asking that very seminal question. And I think this is a discussion which has to go on uh, not for hours but for days and weeks and months because <laughs> there are a lot of thoughts and a lot of new thoughts and new ideas which have also been expounded in this uh, very brilliant discussions by our six. Absolutely amazing panelists. I thank you very profoundly. And since we are completely out of time, I will now request uh, Mr. Ratan Agarwal, our president, to take over. Ratan, over to you. Thank you, Ambassador Kapoor. And uh, thank you, all the panelists and uh, the audience who gave us time. I know on the weekend, uh, it's a precious time with the family. So for all of us to, all of you to make an uh, hour and a half for this very engaging discussion, we really appreciate. I think the couple of, I mean, uh, hopefully the points you walked away with, uh, number one, although in the country of 1.4 billion and with the 900 million people living in the rural India, and I think I heard from some um, one of the speakers, nearly 200, 300 million people who need to be enabled. The magnitude of the problem is very vast. And, uh, we cannot move the needle with just one or two or three innovations. What you saw on today, hopefully three very innovative programs are taking the problem from individual youths to individual communities, colleges, and then all the way to community level transformation as uh, design thinking process uh, Arun talked about. And then also equal participation from the policy makers. This is an area which uh, we cannot move the needle without very effective public-private partnerships. And hopefully you saw that today to Parfi's uh, success, going from Jharkhand to Madhya Pradesh and now launching a program at the national scale. For the first time in India's history, launching a equity-based social impact fund to drive national scale programs and transformation. So you are seeing the role of technology. You are seeing the participation of uh, IIT alumni, coming from the different angles, creating different type of innovations and then engaging our uh, stakeholders from governments to communities. What you saw also today, a handful of innovations. We also just striving to build a portfolio, a coalition of uh, these very innovative programs. We have a number of other programs going in the social entrepreneurship, SOBAS program, Dishti Foundation, Samta Foundation, working with CII to teach uh, the critical skills for the rural entrepreneurs in terms of packaging, in terms of quality, market linkages. So these are all together is how we're going to move the needle. And that is a big focus for wheels to bring these variety of innovations and create cross seeding, cross leverage and multiplier effect. That multiplier effect will be absolutely critical, but we cannot do that without insertion of technology, innovation and public private partnership. So hopefully this is all you saw today. So again, my sincere appreciation and thanks to all of our speakers giving their time. And this is not uh, one stop. We are going to have this conversation continuing. We need to move this conversation forward to create some actionable, scalable programs. Just a couple of uh, final notes. We were not able to take all the questions. So we will be sharing those answers in the FAQ document. You will also have uh, the recording available. Finally. What we are talking about moving the needle in the country will not be possible by just participation of few people. We have a half a million alumni community. We would like all of us to recognize our moral obligation, bring our skills, bring our experience, bring our vast network, and then of course our financial resources to make a difference so we can move it together. And I hope all of you would uh, take time to get involved there are dozens of ways you can get involved from giving your time, giving your experience, giving access to your product innovations, and then more importantly, your financial resources. Everybody has different time in their journey. In the beginning, if you don't have time, your funds are equally critical. When you have 
more capacity, the time, talent, and treasure all are important. Everybody can make a difference. So with that, we hope uh, you will join us in our next webinar. We will be doing our fourth one in the series on water on 28th September, where again, we will be bringing uh, very innovative multiple solutions from individual bore wells to community-based transformation to rivers, to quality, to hand pumps. So it will be very good again set of innovations which you will be seeing and hopefully that will give you a chance to be engaged and work with us together so we can achieve our mission impacting at least 20% of India's rural and surrounding population by 2030. Thank you again. We really appreciate your time and we look forward to seeing you again. Take care. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.